<laughs> Talk about multimedia experience, right? So thank, thank you guys for coming. And thank you also for your incredible videos on the high water line, line and all of the, the time that you put in on that Saturday, too. I really want to thank you guys for, for doing that. It's been a really amazing process. Um, and I want to talk about your videos. We'll sit out, out there and talk about your videos and brainstorm. And I want to share with you what the next steps are. But before we do that, I thought this would be a great opportunity with you here in this space to talk about uh, climate representation in general, to talk about how we represent the climate, how important it is, what these artists are doing in relationship to what you all are doing, because you are now, your video pieces are part of the next iteration of this exhibition. Uh, once your final pieces are done, and if they're good enough, they can be part of the website, part of the High Waterline archive, and we can talk about how to get them to that level to be included um, in those spaces, okay? So what I wanted to do was just talk about uh, how, the work, how the artwork in here that you all are, uh, that you all spent a few minutes with is operating to get you to see some of the issues that you, we've been talking about and that you've all been meditating on as you work on your videos. Climate change, sea level rise, inundation, right? These are the, the themes. So this is, this is a piece by Dako Gamay. Uh, it's a brother and sister duo from the Philippines. And they do immersive video spaces, most of their pieces. And in this particular instance, they wanted to compare two island spaces to each other. So um, on the right here, you have Bantayan Island in the Philippines, which is their home island where they grew up and where Martha lives now. And this is Tonga Tapu in Tonga. It's the, the main island, the capital island of Tonga. And this is where Jake, uh, the brother in Dako Gamay, spent a few years doing research on mining. And you see the mining right here happening. And so they wanted to make a dual channel, two, two channel installation where they compare the island situations. So uh, some of you sat in this space a little bit. So I don't want to explain any more of this. I just want to us to talk a little bit about what you're experiencing and how you feel about seeing the camera move and what kinds of stories, what kinds of narratives are being created. So what do you see? What are the, what are the first things that you see? What strikes you about watching these things together? Let's just start here. What do you see? What's your name? Wenlo. Wenlo? Yeah. Okay. What do I see? Yes. Um. <laughs> Just literally, what do you see? Just tell water, me, tell me. More green on this side and more just ocean views on that side. Okay, okay. Any reason why you think that is? I think uh, maybe it rains more. Okay, summer. okay. Maybe. Not so much. What about the camera angles or the, the camera, you, the, the choice of camera for each two of the pieces? Do, can it, does anyone know what this is, might be filmed with? Drone. Drone, yeah. So the camera angle, because it's this aerial view, I think it gives you that sense of green canopy versus this camera. This is eight millimeter camera that Martha used to uh, on a boat to film the perimeter of Bantayan Island. And they're both around the same size. So just in the difference of the cameras, you get a totally different experience of the two islands. Uh, with those two different camera angles, how do, you, how do you guys feel about seeing both of them at the same time? <laughs> do you feel dizzy? <laughs> Uh, 
what, stri what strikes you in the comparison? Do you feel anything as you're, as you're looking at the two together? An adjective. Give me one, one adjective. What do you, th what do you think? Adjective? Yes. I was going to say something before you said an adjective. Okay, no, I'm just, I'm just trying to get you to talk. I'm just, no, so. I would say that the Philippines, or at least this island, it definitely looks more inhabited than the one being shown um, represented. Well, now there's more structures coming out. Right, this is all, this is construction, yeah. right? Yeah, it just okay. looks more populated. Sure, sure, and it is. Yeah, the Philippines. So part of the narrative here is this comparison of the Philippines, which has millions of people on many, many islands, thousands of islands, uh, living right on the coastline. You can see the development, or the develop. You can see actually not de not not really uh, high level development, but houses right on the shoreline. Uh, in Tonga, you can also see houses right on the shoreline, but the there's, there's not as many people uh, on the islands of, of Tonga. It's a very dramatic contrast. So that population difference um, you notice in the situation. What do we think of that? What do you guys, what do you guys think of, of that difference in relationship to climate change? I'm thinking about some of the issues you were thinking about when you did the high water line. What displacement? What about dis displacement? Just because like these people are so close to the water that any change in sea level drastically impact how they live their lives and where they live. Mm -hmm. And that kind of like compromises some islands, especially in the Philippines and stuff like that, where they have to move elsewhere, mm -hmm. where they have to start planning to move elsewhere. And then, I mean, they're both really flat too. Right, they're both low-lying islands. Yeah. And they're both, so, Partly, so right here's a good opportunity too to see uh, the, the, what the islands are doing in terms of climate adaptation for uh, sea level rise. Here you guys see the seawall that's being built. Um, and here you see they've, they've taken tractors and made this uh, barrier to the island. And there's other parts of the film that show uh, that show rock formations being built. Here's one of them right here to, to slow down the tides that come in. So these are all the, the massive large-scale infrastructure projects that the governments, both governments, both in Tonga and in the Philippines, both of them are doing to try to stave off the, the hurricanes and the typhoons that are coming through. And you're right, they're impacting the populations that are right on the shoreline, right? Uh, so that's happening. There's definitely more population here, but people are having to move uh, in Tangatapu as well. What do you think about the use of, will anything else strike you guys about this, about this piece in relationship to other things that you might have seen about climate change, other films that you might have seen about climate change? How does this feel different than other things that you might have seen? How about you guys in the back, writing diligently? <laughs> <laughs> What else, what, what other film, what films have you guys seen about climate change? Anything? I guess like Nat Geo. Nat Geo? Yeah, mm -hmm. and stuff. Um, very, I don't know, the, like the production of it is huge and there's all kinds of shots and um, Okay, so yeah, there's cuts, yeah. there's there's close-ups, there's aerial views, there's okay. And this is just like it's a very slow, continuous, continuous shot. shot. There's no speaking. No there's speaking. speaking. There's no narrative. Oh my gosh, there's no narrative. What do you guys think about that? How do you feel about not having any narrative here?
I think it's really open to interpretation. Open to interpretation. And it forces you to put more research into what you're seeing. Yeah. To really understand background knowledge. Mm hmm. Um, because you're just one, when you're looking at this, you're like, what is this? Right, what is this? What is going on here? Did you want to, did you want to say something? Too? Oh, um, I think it's also like a representation of like our daily lives who may not be affected by it right now, the present, but it really like looking at this really makes me think about how we have to start planning ahead for future, even if we can't see it right now. Mm-hmm. So, I really love what you guys are saying about this, about how open it is to allowing you to think a little bit more deeply about climate change rather than Nat Geo, which sometimes gives you all of this fact-based information about what's happening, when it's happening, to who is it happening. The narrative is already there for you. What Martha and Jake do in videos like this is create an immersive sensory experience, right? You are right here. The screens are huge. Your position right here. You're flying over this space right here so that you can really think about everything that's happening in that space with your own body, with your own senses. You can engage and understand like, oh, what is happening here? You don't have to have the narrative kind of tell you that story. I like what you're saying too about thinking about the everyday experience of climate change, uh, because that's actually what a lot of the pieces in here are about, is the fact that instead of, instead of drawing on that climate crisis narrative, what is happening in our spaces, actually not even in the future right now, right? What's happening right now? What, how does this wall impact the houses' relationship to the shore, the, the, their access to fisheries. Like for instance, for um, Martha and Jake, they're working a lot with the fishermen and that concrete wall that we saw, the fishermen can't take their boats over that wall and um, they have to climb over that wall and hoist their boats over that wall to get to the fishing grounds that they used to have really, really easy access to, for instance. So it's totally like these, these, these infrastructures that are already in place right now are having a dramatic impact on their everyday lives. They are experiencing climate change now. The Bantayan Island, every time a typhoon comes, it wipes out almost every structure uh, low-lying this, in this space and they rebuild constantly. And there's typhoons now Sometimes there's five typhoons a season right now. So that's a lot of rebuild. Some of them are more powerful and impactful than others, but they've had to rebuild in the last few years a couple of times. And that's pretty dramatic, right? They are experiencing it now. And you can kind of just get that sense, but you also get a sense of the connection and the life that's happening right on the coast, right? And these things are transforming as we build more, as we develop more, as we build up the concrete, as we build up this hardened coastline, this kind of lifestyle is diminishing. You could imagine that this might have been what Hawaii looked like, you know, 50 years ago or 100 years ago, where everyone's right there on the shore. And now we've got Waikiki and Kaka'ako, which we walked through. So that, that, that sense of the land transformation also impacts people's ability to be in relationship to the environment, to understand what the true impact is of climate change. Um, so there's no narrative. What about the soundtrack? You guys hear the bulldozers? So the bulldozers, yeah, they're actually coming from the soundtrack. It's not happening outside. <laughs> This is the sound of this quarry right here. Why do you think Jake wanted that soundtrack? Instead of, instead of the ocean. Why, why was that? Why do you think he made that choice? As, as, art, as, an, as fellow artists, why would he choose bulldozers instead of a boat or ocean? 
what does it do to your feeling of the of the situation? Mm. I guess for me, like, it makes me feel cautious because, I don't know, like, construction areas, there's a lot of moving parts and mm -hmm. happening and, like, big things. And so if you were to put, like, the ocean or, like, the boat swing, it would be really calming, I guess. Okay. Yeah. So he wants you to feel anxious. He wants you to feel, okay, so there's, there's kind of a, like, we have to watch out in that space. I like that. What else? Yeah. If I were him, I would put construction noises and all of this to kind of like foreshadow what the audience should do, um, which is to start building. I don't know if that makes sense. It makes sense in my head. Um, so that. Okay, so so I like. So okay, so he's he's pinpointing building as as a thing that is actually happening, right? So these so the bulldozers are from this quarry who are mining and they are mining the rocks that are then being used to uh, shore up the ocean, sh shore up the shore, right? Th those same rocks are being used on the, on the coast. So question is, does he see that as a positive or a negative? That's the question. Yeah, he wants us to think about that, I think. He doesn't want us to leap right away to the idea that that's what we should be doing. I think he's saying this is what's happening. This is, this is, this is, the, uh, this is the scale of operation that's happening in order to shore up. Um, I think what I like about this, again, you guys said this a little bit, it's open-ended, right? There is an open-endedness to this because he's not narrating it. He's not saying, this is bad or this is good. He's just saying, this is happening. With that in mind, we can think about all of the things like, if it's happening, does it, in my mind, this brings up questions of, uh, of efficacy. Does, if we build more walls, is that going to keep the sea really, is that really going to keep the sea out? And what other impacts does it have? Like if it's impacting the fishermen from being able to get to the shore, are there other solutions besides just building seawalls and extracting land more from one area and, and, and putting it somewhere else? So these are all questions that come from just showing, just immersing ourselves in what's happening now, right? That these are so he's trying to kind of call our attention to that industrial solution that's happening now, that large scale solution, not necessarily saying this is the way forward or this isn't the way forward. Does that make sense? So I think this is a really interesting example of like how art can use media, multimedia, in a very different way than you guys probably usually see it. This is challenging, right? You guys are. <laughs> this is this is a, a challenging um, use of a uh, of video here. So let's go look at, at one other piece, and then we can we can talk a little bit more about high water line. Okay. So you looked at this when you came in. What is it? Wax what paper. is it? <laughs> wax paper melted together. Wax paper melted together in this wall. Yeah. Uh, d did anyone see anything else on the wax paper? Like the, pattern. the pattern. So this is stitching. Did you look at it closely? Oh, okay, okay. Everyone get up for a second. <laughs> did you see this? So this is, this is actually stitched in. She did this with the machine. Um, so this is wax paper. Did anyone see that? What's this right here? What does this look like to you guys? Ice. Well, okay, yeah, okay. It looks like an iceberg, right? Yeah. What is it? How does it look? How how is the feeling of iceberg? How do you get the feeling of an iceberg from looking at this? The colors, like that 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 bright blue or that that deep blue that you get 
that light blue, the, the color of light kind of shining through the transparency of the ice when it's melting. Um, so you get that color. And what else makes you think of ice? What about you guys? Do you see ice? No, you don't see ice. <laughs> what do you see? I saw more of like a, a crashing wave. A crashing wave. Like cool. Water wave. Cool. Okay. Where did you see? A, where did you see a crashing wave? Well, it just kind of looks like white water. Yeah, like the yeah. form of white water. Awesome. Okay. Like white. Like we're inside the water. Oh, this. Okay. Okay. Awesome. So this is kind of coming out at us. Got it. Okay, um, this is actually, it's salt, but I like that white water. It's, it's cool that, it, that you see like white water there too. Yeah, it's salt. This is salt. Yes, it's a lot of salt. And this is, so it's wax paper that she has um, connected together. These are layers. She, you guys can tell that she's torn it and cut it in certain places and even cut it to mimic the shapes of the patterns that she's um, put in here. Did anyone see the pinpricked islands in here? So these are the island, these are the Pacific islands. There's islands right here, right here, right here, right here, all in here. So they're really tiny in relationship to the rest of this space, right? Scale, so she's using scale. She's using these materials. Um, did anyone want to crawl underneath? <laughs> no. <laughs> but it's that. But it's that. It's that sense that she wants us to feel like kind of curious about what's going on in this space, and then being blocked from being able to. Right? That we're curious about the light that. The, the, or, the, the feeling of kind of coolness and warmth that's coming from the space that she wants to draw us to the surface to look at this patterning a little bit more. Um, did, do you see anything else going on here that is, that's interesting? Like what, this, what is this pattern? How did she connect the wax paper together? How did she do this? iron so heat heat right heat so she's she's actually using the material metaphor the elemental metaphor of climate change heat to create through wax paper this image of an iceberg um, why is the iceberg relevant to climate change What's the narrative? Yes. <laughs> right. Okay. So we're putting the story together, right? We're just like very, very simple narrative. The, the, the melting of the ice caps, Greenland, the Arctic and the Antarctic is what's causing sea level rise. So she's combining spaces. Basically she is giving us both reference points to the ice and the Pacific at the same time and kind of conflating those spaces together, connecting those spaces to show the, the impact that, that interconnect, those interconnected bodies of water have together. It's all the same water, right? We have had the same water for 4.2 billion years. It just keeps cycling through our bodies, the ocean, the rivers, the, the sky, the ice, everything. So she wants to kind of connect those spaces that seem so far apart to show their impact uh, on each other. And also kind of show the, and dwarf the, that scale of the islands in relationship to this watery space. But there's also something else going on here with these, um, these lines. Does anyone know what these lines are? They are the, Okay, so this is where this is where a little bit like if you're curious about the lines, then you have to kind of do a little bit of research. What is it about these bubbles? What's going on here? The bubbles represent the exclusive economic zones. Uh, so 200 miles around every island or continent, every landmass, 
There is, um, according to the international law agreements made in the 80s, um, every nation state has access to 200 miles of ocean connected off their shoreline. And they are in charge of the fisheries, the natural resources, uh, everything that, that is encompassed in those economic zones. Uh, so what, what's fascinating about the Pacific Islands is that even though those land masses are really, really small, the ocean resources that they have access to are immense, more immense than even continents. So they have access, because they're in the middle of the ocean, they have access to all of these deep sea resources that are now um, starting to be mined. And we are mining them for our computers, for solar panels, uh, for all of the technology that we're using to stop climate change. Um, so there's this kind of reverse logic going on where we're using, we're, we're mining more <laughs> to, so, to theoretically resolve climate change. The issue that she sees going on here that concerns her, like in Tonga and Bantayan Island, which, um, which we were looking at in there, is that what happens is that international bodies and um, larger governments become involved in helping smaller islands build those seawalls and try to build infrastructure to adapt to climate change and when they do that, they also leverage their support by then having access to all of these um, uh, natural resources. So they're basically eyeing and helping Pacific Island nations so that they can mine. Um, so there's a political situation here, right? A political uh, disparity, a power disparity uh, that that concerns Mary, just like it concerns Jake and Martha um, in the, the media pieces, the, the media piece that we just saw title, because they're really, they're, they're, they want to see solutions for climate change, but they also want to see solutions that are equitable. Solutions that don't negatively impact um, poor populations that, um, that then don't have access to those natural resources, don't have a say in the solutions that are, um, that are carried forth. Um, and so there's all of these kind of big government and policy drivers at the, at the heart of this that they want to be involved in the conversation. And so the pieces, even though they're about climate change per se, like the science of climate change, sea level rise, et cetera, they're also trying to pinpoint or get us to think about the political aspects of this and the cultural aspects of this. So there's another layer here that's really important in all of the pieces in the show, and it's that, it's that cultural layer, okay? So let's look at one more, and then we'll talk, we'll talk about your pieces, because this, this piece, I think, is important in... Um, in where we're going with the high water line. So come closer, you guys, so you can see some details. I'll see here. OK, so does anyone recognize this geography or it, these images? Do you recognize this? Not quite. So do you, do you see that they're maps? OK. Um, who, who recognizes something? What? They're all Oahu. They're all Oahu. This is Waikiki. OK. This is, this is the Alawai right here and the, and the boat harbor. Um, and this is like Ala Moana area and the boat harbor. What about this? Airport, so you see the airport right here? Okay, and then this is Kaneohe Bay, you, you said that, yeah. Okay, so we've got three areas, and what do, you, what do you see changing in the three, or the four iterations? It's 
It's sea level. It's a sea level rise map, like the ones we looked at for Kaka'ako or the ones you guys have been looking at for Kaka'ako. So we've got here the kind of same scenarios that Adele um, gave us for Kaka'ako when we were walking. This is present day, um, three feet, five feet, 10 feet. So there's no, and there's no end date for this because like she said, you know, it depends on what kind of infrastructure and what kinds of um, things we implement as a community um, that will change when this or if this kind of scenario happens, right? So here you've got at the 10, 10 feet sea level rise, pretty much all of Waikiki is gone, is, is water. Um, did anyone look at what these were? What do these look like from, from where you're sitting? sitting? Fish, do they look like fish from there? What do they look like from, from there? What do they look like from where you're sitting? I had the same answer. What? I had the same answer. What? Fish. Fish, okay, so you saw them, you saw the, you saw them close up too? Okay, good, good eyes. <laughs> I can't even see that far. Um, so you've got fish kind of coming back into the area into all of these areas. And these are, these are prints, uh, Gicle prints, where she's kind of made these schools of fish, like um, uh, poi balls uh, that you, like um, fish balls, like bait balls, that's what I'm talking about. Bait balls, where fish are swimming in schools close to each other, they're overwhelming you, um, kind of coming back into the landscape. What, what about this map relates to what we talked about with uh, in, in Kaka'ako? Like, do these, maps, do these maps narrate the same kind of story that Adele was telling with the stops in Kaka'ako? And in what way? What was the story that Adele was um, telling us with with the the high water line walk in Kakako. Do you guys remember any of the stops where she showed the pictures? You guys were so concerned with getting film. Pay attention. Like half of it was her talking about how some of it like should be turned back into like and stuff. Like I think that tasted on the most to me. And then with this, it's more of like the realization that it with how Okay. Okay. So go back to what you said originally, that she was communicating a wetlands. So she was communicating the fact that, that Kaka'ako, like Waikiki, historically was wetlands. It was, this was, this is all landfill or reclaimed land or sand fill like you guys are watching this video too right this is all reclamation projects this is what happens when you when you fill in all of that land um, you're making you're making artificial land that's pretty low lying and it just water wants to come back to where it once was so in all of these spaces, it's basically the ocean and the fish are reclaiming spaces where, um, where it used to be. So it's the same, so the same thing is, Keely is kind of narrating the same scenario in her print that, that Adele was, was narrating while we were walking, but we were in that space. We were just like sitting there in that space, which was really cool, yeah. Yeah. It does. It does slow down the process. That's part of the natural barrier. Um, the the issue is is that as the as sea level rises, you have to do that more and more often, um, and it doesn't really like there's there's more pollution. There's going to be more so. The other thing that the other thing that's important to narrate here. Let me get my um, my phone really quickly. 
The other thing that Adele mentioned on the walk in just one stop that you guys might have missed as you were, um, as you were filming, but one of the other things that is important to think about with inundation or sea level rise is it's not just a bathtub model. It's not just the ocean coming in, but it's the ocean and the sea level rise raising the, the freshwater aquifer underneath the island. And it's also all of the concrete that we've put on all of these roads and surfaces that allows water to rush from the top when we have a storm rush from the top of the mountains down to the ocean. So we've got flooding not just from the ocean, we've got flooding from, from, um, from the mountains and from the sewage system and the aquifer. So inundation or sea level rise is actually not just water coming from the ocean, it's all of this stuff that's happening to our fresh water system as well. And that's what Jake and Martha are also trying to talk about with that video too, that the mining actually impacts the freshwater aquifer that's underneath all the limestone that they're using to, <laughs> to try and stave off the ocean. So, but it's actually not going to do its job in, in keeping flooding from happening uh, um, through the water table, right? So just building seawalls or just doing land reclamation isn't enough. We need other kinds of nature-based solutions that restore the watershed, that restore the whole integration of the watershed um, together. So that's, that's kind of like, sand helps a little bit, but it doesn't really think in an ecological way about the connection between all water systems. And that's, that's another kind of major kind of lesson from all of these artists too, yeah. Yeah. Um, so for like totally subtopic, but like common case stuff that they're probably like same volume and stuff like tapping into the water table. Right. All this directly affect everything that they're trying to build right now. Right. Um, yes. Yes. And that is one of the what that is one of the Kiai's uh, protests. Yeah. Yeah. So um, so these are the these are kind of the stakes of uh, of of sea level rise, right? That that we're dealing with the, this integration of, um, of all of these water issues together. I thought about, I thought what we could do is just talk a little bit about your videos in relationship to this, uh, to this installation. Um, and maybe look, we can pinpoint a few to look at and, um, and talk about them. And what I would love to first talk about is just what you guys liked best about each other's videos.